Lana Kalinina is tired of playing the doting wife to a forever absent husband and an even more self-absorbed father. Danny, her son sits before the TV, his eyes glued to the screen where Ryan Hawks delivers yet another memorable performance on field. Oh how she wishes Edward could see how passionate Danny is about soccer, that it's what is good for him, not boxing. She puts the jacket and scarf around Danny and urges him to get to his feet lest he'll be late for playing his own soccer game. Edward marks that he'll be taking Danny to his old boxing coach as soon as he closes his current deal. When Lana insists that soccer is what Danny is passionate about, Edward scoffs her off with a derogatory comment about her knowing it all and making decisions. Lana loves taking and developing photos with her retro camera. She is busy taking another round of shots while watching Danny play when she receives a text from Edward telling that he won't be able to make it to the game because of work. Danny is sad, he was not able to score a single goal in the game. Lana cheers him on, he cannot score in every game, not even his hero Hawks could do it. He asks about his papa. Lana makes an excuse about him having to work late. She quickly changes the subject and confides that she took very many photos of him so his papa could see what a soccer star he is. Ryan Hawks, after scoring a difficult but winning goal for his team, is only three goals away from Wondolowski, and Wright Phillips shared record of 27 goals in a season. With the playoffs coming up, he has got to fancy his chances. His agent Billy's excitement is through the roof as they meet for the after party. He gushes on about Arsenal calling again and if he likes English food then they have a great offer for him. They want him big time. They are talking about doubling what Ryan makes now and that would be without all the extra endorsements that he has currently going on. Ryan blows him a kiss saying that is why he loves Billy so much. He then steps out for some autograph signings and paparazzi photos, meanwhile asking Billy to excuse his presence at the Make-A-Wish Foundation that Sunday. He needed to focus on the playoffs. He wants to set the record. And since he can't make it, he asks Billy to donate some money as compensation. 100 or 200 grands maybe. Ryan's girlfriend Elise Martin cuts through the crowd then. She runs into his arms congratulating him for the club record and Ryan greets her with a kiss. He then turns to the crowd cheering that it has been a good night but it's going to get even better. He drops to his knees holding Elise's hand in his own and asks her to marry him. Elise shows off her ring to the gathered fans and the couple returns back inside. Billy is not quite on board with Ryan's decision. He advises him to think a bit more on it. Back at the party while Elise gushes about the proposal and her ring, Ryan gets busy drinking. On their way back from the game, Lana witnesses Edward with another woman walking into a bar. They get home and Lana sets about developing the photos from the game. She explains the process to Danny as she goes. The two of them are still working on them when Edward comes home. He enters Lana's dark room commenting on the new pictures. Danny hands him a fresh one that he has just developed. When Edward questions him what place it was, Danny solemnly answers that it's from his game that he has missed today. Edward apologizes in a patronizing tone wanting to know if Danny has scored any goals. When Danny admits that he hasn't, Edward replies that there was nothing really missed then. Kissing Danny's head Lana ushers him out to go do his homework. She turns back to Edward, her gaze burning holes in the back of his head. Edward snaps at her, someone has got to earn money for the family or else they will starve to death. Just Lana's films alone cost a fortune. It's a pity that Lana didn't have more of them, she would have loved to take pictures of him with that other woman. When Edward feigns ignorance, Lana tells him what she has seen. Infuriated he turns around and smashes her camera to the floor muttering that's what she gets for spying on him. He hovers over her, his fingers crushing Lana's arms. When she tries to shove him back, he backhands her across the face. Danny who has been witnessing this altercation from the slightly ajar door, intervenes then, running over his mama, pushing his papa away from her. Driving back from their party Ryan is a little buzzed, he is speeding down the freeway anyway. Elise shows him posts from tabloids, pointing that they are now almost as famous as the Kardashians. Their news is everywhere from ESPN to TMZ to Twitter. As Ryan bobs over to see the post, he runs them straight into a passerby vehicle causing an impact of great magnitude. Early the next morning Lana ushers Danny inside the car, she had packed what the bare minimum that they would need. It wasn't an easy decision but one that she had to make if not for her own sake then for Danny's. She is going to leave Edward. As she shuts the car trunk shut Edward spots her from afar, he's just returned from his morning walk. But Lana is not giving him any say in it this time. She hurries into the driver's seat, Edward hollers from behind that she will be destroying this family but for Lana the damage has long been done. He reminded her that she has never earned a penny in her life, she will starve Danny at this rate and soon will come back running to him for refuge. Dazed Ryan opens his eyes to find himself in a hospital bed. The first thing coming from his lips is Elise's well-being. He asks where she is, how she is. Billy comes forward, Ryan tells him that he could feel there's something wrong with his leg. Billy tries to be his usual cheerful self, he explains that his leg got banged up a little bit, the doctors have taken care of it. As Ryan tries to move his arm he finds it cuffed to the bedrail. Billy discloses that there has also been a fumble with the law but he and his lawyers are working through it. 
a little community service, some don't drink and drive public service announcements, along with a few bucks to the Alcoholics Anonymous will surely be enough to put this behind him. Everything's going to be fine. As reality starts to sink in, Ryan realizes that he won't be able to make it to the playoffs or even the World Cup, for that matter. Oh how he wanted to get that record. Billy hushes him over the nonsense, he assures him that he will be back in the field before he knows it and he will get this record, and every other one while at it. He will also get a driving under the influence record. Billy could understand how Ryan could be so thoughtless. What exactly was he trying to do, redesign the Pacific Coast Highway? Did he think he was Frank Lloyd Wright? Ryan couldn't contain his chuckle at that, but he is scared. Billy kisses his cheek and steps back out telling him that Ryan should rest, and that he will be right outside if he needs him. At her grandma's home Lana sits with her at the table fumbling with her broken camera. Grandma Marina solemnly inquires if Lana is sure about leaving her husband. Lana then shows her the bruise on her arm from last night. Marina gasps, she had no idea. How could she have missed it? Lana assures her that she has been diligent at keeping it from her, she was ashamed of it. Marina welcomes her to reside with her as long as she likes, she is happy to have them. Lana shares her plan of finding work at the Grand Hotel where her own mother used to work while alive. There are still people there who remember her, maybe they will take her in. Marina asserts that those people won't have any right to turn Lana down given that her mother worked an honest living there all her life. She then offers to look after Danny while Lana will be off to work, she might as well teach him chores to help around the house, she jibes. Danny protests that he's allergic to chores. Grandma then relays to him the story of World War II and how she learned to do a lot more than just household chores at his age, like to always carry food in her pockets. A few days later, Ryan tries to put some weight on his injured leg as the nurse leads him through his routine exercise. He has been making a quick recovery. Billy walks in at that moment, chirpy as ever, carrying a suit for Ryan's press conference. Dressed up to the nine, Ryan stands before the camera flashes and reporters that have been his ally for as long as he could remember. But today he isn't here to bask in their compliments, he is here to extend his apology. He apologizes to his fans for what he has done, driving under the influence was both reckless and irresponsible. Especially in regards to his teammates because as it appears this injury means he will not be able to play in the playoffs or the Summer World Cup next year. The next morning as Lana rounds the corner, ready to go job hunting, she watches her car getting towed away. She hurries over to the personnel and demands him to unhand her car. The man sullenly replies that the owner of the car wants it back. When Lana tries to assure him that there is no other owner, the man scoffs at her, she doesn't look like Edward. Lana tries to bribe him with what little savings she had, but it was to no avail. A little shaken but undeterred she sets off on foot towards her destination. Ryan sits striking odd and even notes on his piano, a bottle of beer and his painkillers sat atop it. He gets a call from Billy who urges him to not tune into Fox Sports anytime soon. Naturally he flips the TV to Fox Sports then. The anchor was relaying news about Ryan's spot being pulled, also that his current Dewey shows how irresponsible he can be which in turn means that his soccer days are done. Billy advises him to just lay low and do his community service. And once this is over, they will all be back to kissing his behind. At the Grand Hotel the hiring manager relates with Lana over the issue of a difficult divorce. She tells her that when she herself was getting one she had left the town for some time to get things settled. When she came back, her ex didn't even remember her. She suggests Lana to give it a try. Pulling out a brochure she hands it to her explaining their company's training programs. One such program is for employees in other hotels and cruise liners. If Lana accepts this she will have to leave town for a while. That night Lana breaks the news to Danny about her taking a job out of town. Danny wanted to know how far away Greece was. Lana assures him that it isn't quite that far, short flight south, near Mediterranean Sea. Marina inquires if the job will be paying her well, leaving family behind ought to have some perks after all. Lana nods her head, it will be merely six weeks. As Lana says goodbye to her family grandma Marina hands her a present. She has gotten Lana's camera fixed for her. It was now good as new, complete with a new black and white film inside. Teary-eyed Lana hugs her grandma. The cruise liner is not the largest but it is certainly the only one Lana has been on in her lifetime. The ship has been on a number of recreational and leisure voyages. Mr. Zimmer, the captain, briefs the new staff about the ship's makeup, comprising five sails, four diesel engines, three decks, two five-star restaurants and one casino. He explains how onboard amenities, attractions, activities and entertainment options are an integral part of the cruise experience. The guests expect excellence from the staff, and they are to deliver it at all costs. Captain Zimmer shows Lana to her room, a quarter really, which she is to share with three other girls. He assigns her one hour to unpack and get dressed in her given uniform then meet him in the ballroom for further instructions. Two of her roommates, Sabine and Angela, became her fast friends thanks to their extroverted nature. However the third, Amanda, was a bitter pill to swallow. A couple of hours later, Lana has gotten the hang of her bartending job. Although mixing cocktails has never been her forte, she's confident that she can weather that storm just as well. 
At a party with Elise one night, where her friends continue to drool over her ring and pester them about a wedding date, Ryan decides to walk away. He slouches on the fire hydrant by the side of the road nursing another martini. He's lost count of how many he has had. Elise tracks him down, she complains about him drinking without her. A sip of the drink sends her gagging and she returns the tumbler back to him. She wants to know if he is coming back inside or is he having too much fun sulking out here. Ryan shakes his head, he isn't sure if he can do this right now. Elise asks him to elaborate his meaning. Ryan apologizes imploring that he needs more time, but Elise has been gone a whole month. Which struck a chord with Ryan, it was Elise's choice, she had taken time for herself. Now it was time for Ryan to take care of himself. He needs time for himself and not just from Elise, from all this charade, the spotlight, the paparazzi. Elise is indignant, she did not just tell the world that they are about to get married so Ryan can go and have some pill-popping meltdown. He could have killed her in that car accident and she could have sued him for everything, but she has stuck by his side. Now it's his turn to man up. They are going to get married this summer. Ryan scoffs, his shoulders shrugging with momentary defeat. She must really love him. He signals for a passing cab to stop and leaves Elise shrieking there on the sidewalk. She said summer, right. Ryan finds himself on a cruise ship in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea somewhere near the islands. For the first time in weeks, he is able to truly breathe again. As he stands there taking in the mesmerizing view of the glittery blue waters expanded before his eyes, he gets a call from Billy. Reluctantly Ryan picks up. He wanted to know where Ryan was. What was he thinking? He cannot just leave. They have major problems breathing down their necks. That Dewey has put him in breach of contract which means Lang's not obligated to pay him a dime. Now he is most definitely thinking of cancelling his contract altogether and suing him. This is no time to be taking a vacation. Lana spies from the cabin doors, Ryan Hawks throwing his phone away in the waters. Smiling slyly, she gets back to serving drinks. That night in her room Lana walks in on Sabine and Angela drooling over a picture that Sabine has taken of Ryan Hawks. He is perfect, she says. Angela remarks she would love to get down and dirty with him if a chance provides itself. Lana reminds them that he is engaged. Amanda chimes in, pointing that TMZ reports that he and Elise have broken up. Besides, Elise isn't here, Amanda is. Angela says Zimmer will fire anyone he catches fraternizing with the guests. The next evening Lana is busy polishing the glassware when Ryan slides into a chair at the bar. Addressing her with her given name he introduces himself. Lana knew him of course, who wouldn't recognize Ryan Hawks. Slightly annoyed that he could not escape his public persona Ryan asks her if there is a guest's memo or something. Lana smiles and inquires what she could get for him. Ryan encourages her to drop the formalities with him. He then orders a dirty martini. A few hours and three martinis later, Ryan is still there and the staff is closing the place for the night. Turning to Lana he urges her to talk to him. Ryan catches the impression that she does not want to talk to him. With a sigh, Lana asks him what brings him to this cruise. Ryan shrugs, maybe he just came here to drown. Lana remarks that in case there is an accident and the ship starts sinking, she will be there manning the lifeboats. It is her job to save people from drowning. Nodding his head, Ryan attempts to get to his feet. Lana suggests that he should go to his bed now. Ryan complies, but only because he likes her. He stands to leave fumbling through the words that he will see her soon. Lana agrees, it's a small ship and this is the only bar. As Ryan is stepping out, Sabine walks in her eyes dashing inquisitively between Ryan's retreating form and Lana. Once the three of them are in their room, Angela grills Lana about what a man worth $50 million feels like. Sabine has read that he has lost all his endorsements and his team is about to sue him. Lana assures them that their conversation was merely platonic, she made him drinks and talked to him because she had to. Amanda enters the room then, latching onto the conversation she sneers that is what Lana is like, sensible like a pair of nurses sneakers. And men like Ryan don't go for women like her. Early the next morning Lana sets about straightening the lounge chairs by the pool, she finds Ryan splayed on one, drunk and drooling. Hearing her footsteps he greets her as his lifeguard. His inebriated state makes Lana advise him to stop drinking. Ryan wastes no time in doing her bidding and tosses the tumbler to the side crashing it on the deck. Lana winces, just another thing that she needs to clean up. Watching her get down on her knees to clean up his mess, Ryan is ashamed of his action. He stoops beside her and helps her collect the shards. On a video call from Danny Lana learns that he has been settling in quite well with her grandma. He tells her that he has made a new friend, her name's Elena. Lana is surprised to hear that it's a girl, Danny never liked girls before. That evening when he stops by the bar Ryan apologizes for his behavior earlier, dequerists and painkillers are a terrible combination. That and the fact that most women, when they meet him are a lot flirtier, a lot nicer. Well, Lana is not like most women, she replies. And she is definitely not his kind of woman. Ryan wouldn't say that. He shakes his head, nice try at salvaging. He follows her out the door urging her to take a break with him. Lana requests him to stop following her, he would get her in trouble. 
Just then Captain Zimmer asks Lana to come speak with him in private, leaving Ryan flabbergasted. He quickly makes a story about her helping him decide which drink he had ordered. Zimmer instructs Lana to take Friday off. She cannot work for four consecutive weeks without taking a day off. This is unacceptable. With Zimmer safely out of their hair Ryan suggests a new idea. They can meet off the boat. She has a day off so she will be free for Friday. He can be her tour guide for Greece, he's great at it, can pretty much Google anything she wants to see and know. And she can in turn teach him Russian. Reluctantly Lana agrees. The next day when the ship docks on the island Lana disembarks it. Captain Zimmer sets her off with clear instructions that the ship will leave at 10 in the morning the next day. She must be on the boat no later than midnight. As Lana strolls through the shoreside stall set up by locals Ryan joins her greeting her with assurance that their time together will be their little secret. They walk along the water and Lana asks him about all those sorrows that he mentioned were drowning him. Ryan isn't sure they need to go there just yet but Lana insists that Russians don't do small talk, heavy stuff only. Ryan sighs, he confesses that he hasn't made peace with the fact that his knee is shot and his endorsements have to endorse him and if he does get to play again he won't be the player he once was. So there isn't much to worry about, his life is basically over. Lana believes that when one door closes, others open. Ryan eyes her suspicious whether she was some undercover journalist that got on board with him. They both laugh at the absurdity of the thought. For Ryan it is not about seeing doors, it's more about how people see him. Lana observes that he is actually afraid that people are not going to like him for who he really is. Ryan scoffs, when you are in the spotlight everybody wants to be your friend. But as he is finding out, when that goes away so does everyone else. Lana suggests that he should set his mind to something other than soccer now that he has all this time on his hands. Ryan admits that's what worries him. He doesn't know anything else. Ryan hasn't always been this hotshot athlete. He has trained his whole life to be the best he can be at this one thing, playing soccer. All the other stuff just came with the territory. So now without soccer, he is not anything really. Lana isn't buying it. She is certain Ryan possesses many more talents. He just isn't aware of them yet. There is the whole world out there waiting to be discovered, but no one can discover anything without taking the first step. With that she casually steers them into the water and spatters him with it until they are both semi-drenched. Their stroll leads them to a group of kids playing ball. Ryan returns the ball to one of them and they recognize him. Lana urges him to go play along with them. It will make their year if not life. Ryan takes her cue and joins them. Lana captures these moments in her camera. Ryan's knee isn't quite healed as much as he would have liked so Lana fetches some ice for him after the game. They sit by the sidewalk and Ryan thanks her for encouraging him to play. It felt great. Lana waves the compliment, she's sure he gets way more encouragement than that from her fiancé. They look so good together. That is the thing, Ryan remarks, they're good for magazines and photos. But not good for each other. He came out here because he was uncertain of their relationship but things are becoming clearer now. Lana finds that moment as good as any to request him to sign one more autograph. For Donnie, she tells Ryan that he once had the tryout for Zents in St. Petersburg boys, but now just plays for fun. Ryan is his hero. Ryan invites Lana to have dinner with him. He knows this really nice five-star place with delicious food and a spectacular spot. Lana isn't convinced this could be a good idea but Ryan's insistence bends her will. Lana hurries to her room aboard the ship. She needs Angela and Sabine's help. She has nothing to get dressed for this dinner. Lana meets Ryan at the decided spot dressed in a teal silk dress. Her icy blonde hair made her look like a Greek goddess walking up to him. They get to the restaurant which turns out to be a haystack diner with the board announcing its name five stars. Ryan is mortified, he suggests that they should head back to the main street and find a finer restaurant there but Lana insists on staying. They have dinner which Ryan jokes couldn't be more than two days old. Lana takes in the view in the company, snapping a few more photos while at it. Eventually Ryan agrees, this place was perfect. He didn't get exactly what he wanted but he got something even better. They dance to the acoustics playing. As they lay on a blanket with Lana teaching him various words in Russian Ryan whispers that she has an uncanny ability to make him forget all that is bad and focus on only the good happening around him. He kisses her then, gentle, sweet and oh so long. Suffice it to say that they nearly miss their ship. Lana wakes up the next morning with the sun shining high on the horizon. They make it to the cruise before 10 but it does not go unnoticed by Zimmer. He is there waiting for Lana when she tries tiptoeing to her room. Zimmer points out that Lana's identity card was never scanned back in last night. Her friends tried to cover for her but he knows exactly where she has been. Amanda told him that she has absconded into the island with Mr. Hawks, which is highly inappropriate. Lana's attempts at clarification are swept sideways. Zimmer reminds her that fraternizing with the guests is an irreversible breach of contract. She should go pack her things now because he wants her off the ship instantly. Dejected and mortified, Lana makes her way off board. Ryan follows her infuriated about the unfairness of this whole situation. Lana requests him to let it go, she has been embarrassed enough for the day. Sighing, Ryan asks to at least let him compensate for her accommodations. He takes her to a resort he used to frequent a few years back. Reminiscing about old times makes him want to stay there a little longer. They get two rooms for the night. The next morning on call with Grandma and Danny, Lana tells them that she's in Halkidiki. 
and will be home in a few days. Danny is surprised, she was supposed to be in Mykonos. That's where the ship is, Lana retorts. That afternoon Ryan finds her on the terrace tracing a brush through her hair. He presents her with the Lockhart pendant that they had come across on a stall by the beach. Lana is torn, she does not want Ryan to think too much into this relationship. He is engaged and Lana's life is a mess. Ryan insists that he has taken this trip for a reason. He and Elise are not meant to be together. Lana is not convinced. They come from two completely different worlds. Legally she is still married. She confesses that she has wanted to tell him earlier but she never thought this would get so far with him. It was supposed to be fun, a recess for him. Ryan admits to having been a confused man when he stepped on that ship but not anymore. And it's because of her. Lana reminds him that he's only known her for five days. Ryan reiterates that he has played soccer all his life but she has made him forget it even exists. They are meant to be together. He pulls her in for a kiss. Lana could no longer resist. She melts into his embrace, their bodies working in sync with one another. Ryan drives Lana to the airport the next day. There he realizes he has got no way to get in touch with her, no email or phone number. Lana remarks what if they go back to their lives and he realizes that it wasn't meant to be. Ryan insists that could never be. So Lana suggests that in two months if he still feels the same way, he can come find her. They need that time to go back to their lives and do what needs to be done. Then if he still feels the same then he can come find her at Sint. She then hands him a parting gift, the film from her camera. Lana gets home earlier than expected. Danny and Grandma are still busy decorating the house for her welcome. Danny hugs her for a long while. She delivers them the good news that she won't have to leave again. Surreptitiously she tells her grandma that she's been fired. She then presents Danny with the autograph from Ryan Hawks. He runs off into the living room to show his papa, who, Lana then learned, has been there this whole time. As Lana helps her grandma with the dishes she asks her how she could have let Edward into the house. Marina reminds him that good or bad, he is the father of her son. When Danny had asked her to invite him, she couldn't say no. For the past two weeks Edward has spent quite a bit of time with him. Lana soon finds a job working as a maid in a small inn. One afternoon she asks Edward to have tea together. He tells her how he and Danny have grown closer, like father and son. He takes him to boxing and Danny's surprisingly good at it. She hands him the papers, divorce papers. Edward scoffs, if she wants divorce then Danny will stay with him. She will only see him when he allows it. And she will also pay him alimony. Lana protests that he can't do that and she is not afraid of him anymore. Edward looks at her intently, how has she suddenly become so brave? There must be something, or someone. She is having an affair. Well then she should better ask her lover to pay for everything, including Danny's expenses. She won't be getting anything from him, he hollers grabbing the papers off the table and storming out. Ryan's test results have shown that the soft tissue has fully healed and the prosthetic is working as it should. His range of motion is extraordinary considering it has only been a few months. There's still a long way to go but there's hope that he will soon be able to play again. Lang holds a tabloid in his hand with a full spread of pictures from Ryan's little escapade with a blonde woman. He points it towards Billy who has told him that Ryan has been gone to get his head straight. Ryan assures him that when he gets back on the field Lang's going to beg him to stay. Lang dismisses the meeting by asking Ryan to prove his own words. Billy agrees with Lang over one thing, if Ryan wants to go to the World Cup he can only prove his fitness by playing. And he needs Lang on his side for that to happen. Canoodling with another gold digger won't do him any favors in this regard. Indignant about Billy's turn of phrase Ryan snaps that he has no idea what he is talking about. Billy is taken aback by Ryan's reaction as he storms off telling him to not bother calling him because he will be unreachable for a couple days. May 25th. Ryan checks into the Grant Hotel Europe in St. Petersburg and Lana dresses for the day. Danny gets seriously injured by a group of rowdy little boys while playing outside with Elena. Lana rushes him to the hospital. The doctors tell her that they won't be able to run any tests until the swelling in his brain subsides. He was in a coma right then and they could be looking at possible brain damage. Meanwhile Ryan, who has gotten to Alexander Column in Palace Square, waits for quite a while after 8pm, but Lana never shows up. Back at the hospital grandma urges Lana to go home and get some rest. The doctors have said that Danny is unlikely to wake up anytime before morning. Recalling their meeting Lana rushes to Palace Square but it's long after Ryan has left. Danny slowly wakes up later the next morning. Lana is by his side and he tells her that he's scared. Lana reassures him that it was okay to feel that way. He has had an accident. Ryan wakes up the next morning still in his clothes from last, his mind made up. He is going to extend his stay and try his luck at finding Lana. His resolve is short-lived as he can't seem to find any clues that would lead him to her. Heartbroken, he sets off towards the airport. On his way he passes a football club and a thought strikes him. He asks the driver if that is where Zenit plays. At the driver's affirmation he asks him to drop him there instead. Danny MRI results show the swelling has gone down. The circumstances have changed now. He might be able to make full recovery. At the club the administration could help him much. Danny is a pretty popular Russian name and without a last name or age, there was no hope. 
Just as Ryan is about to give up one more time he runs into an old colleague, Vladislav Radimov. After the pleasantries Vladislav invites Ryan to join him for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, they were visiting hospitals today. His presence might make someone's year. They get to the hospital and while Ryan is getting his tour a nurse approaches them saying that they have a big fan of his in the neighboring ward. Would he mind going and greeting him? The doctor leads him to Danny's room and Ryan is amazed to see all of his merchandise decorating every available surface there. Danny is over the moon. Ryan tells Danny that he could relate to getting injured while playing. He asks what day it happened. The doctor answers. It was a few days ago, the 25th. Ryan then invites him to come and watch his game in low once he gets better. As he gets up to leave Ryan spots the napkin that he had autographed. He asks Danny where he got it. Danny explains his mom got it for him, she said Ryan was on her ship. Ryan's hands are shaking, words barely leave his mouth as he asks Danny his mother's name. Lana. It is Lana. Frantic, Ryan asks Danny to tell him where his mom is now. Danny replies that she has left a short while ago, she would probably be crossing the bridge if she hadn't caught the metro. Ryan is running, he can't take any chances this time. He refuses to take any. The bridge is pulling apart when he gets there, he spots Lana walking on the opposite end. He shouts her name and Lana stops. But the bridge has already begun to pull apart. No, Ryan won't take any chances today. With a calculated measure Ryan sprints in Lana's direction lunging over the separation. He finally has her his arms. Lana is finally in Ryan's arms as they drive into an urgent kiss. She asks him how he found her. Ryan relays to her how Danny helped. The commentators announce Ryan Hawks as a literal walking miracle taking the field for Team USA for the first time since his career-threatening injury. He scored 25 goals last season. Danny, Grandma Marina and a heavily pregnant Lana cheer him on from the crowd. It is a tough game, Ryan falls down a few times as the pressure builds with each passing minute. He still comes through though. He manages to score the winning goal. 